book of Job, book of Job, right before the book of Psalms, almost right in the middle of your Bible. If you flip your Bible right open to the middle, it opens up to the book of Psalms. And then if you go one book prior to that, you'll get to the book of Job, commonly known to new believers as the book of Job, all right, the book of Job. We'll start out in verse 1 tonight. Our text verse is ver- verse 7, but I want to give a little bit of an introduction. Who was this man, Job? Why was he included in the Bible? And what was going on in his life? The Bible says this, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect. That means he was complete. He was mature and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. That means to run away from it. That means when he saw evil coming or if he was around evil, he said, "Uh uh-uh, not for me, I'm gone. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. The substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Now, the time and the setting of Job is just after the flood. Flood happens in Genesis chapter 6, and sometime in that early period after uh, this, in fact, they mention, uh, the flood is mentioned, uh, the time before the flood is mentioned in the book of Job, and uh, Job was very blessed, and uh, by the way, there's nothing uh, wrong with being blessed, and uh, we see his substance was great, and uh, now he didn't have a large petting zoo, okay? All of these animals listed in verse 3, these are not only agricultural animals, but industrial animals. Uh, Job was involved in transportation, he was involved in farming, he was involved in many different things. These were revenue sources. This went, you just didn't have uh, sheep and cattle and oxen and, uh, and, and, and camels and things like that simply because that you enjoyed feeding them, all right? How many of you have ever had a horse, all right, and then decide to call it a hay burner and you realize how much uh, hay they actually take? Uh, this was, these were working animals. Uh, this, these were different revenue streams and different businesses that Job was involved in. Now, most of us are familiar a little bit with the book of Job that uh, a great calamity, great calamity, great loss, great reversals happened. Uh, but why did they happen? By the way, the, the book of Job is not specifically about suffering. It's about the sovereignty of God. When you read through the book of Job, when you're studying the book of Job, when you're trying to understand suffering and loss, it's not so much about losing everything and going through hard times. It's the fact that God is sovereign and God has the right to be God. Now, <clears throat> let's pick up in verse 6 and we'll find out why all this tragedy happened. And it ties directly into our subject we're studying. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Now, pause. What happens here is God pulls back the curtain, as he does a few times, and we get to peer into the heavens. We get to have a glimpse of what goes on behind the veil that's between us and heaven. We get to see what's going on in heaven. Now, this was a heavenly staff meeting. How many of you gone to a staff meeting or a business meeting or a team meeting, all right? You've had to go in and all the team has to report to the boss and the boss gives you some instructions and what's going on. And, and so, this is what's happening. God calls a staff meeting has all the sons of God. Now, in the Old Testament Scripture, sometimes the angels were referred to as the sons of God. And so, the angels are coming, giving a report, telling what's going on in these different areas. And uh, the Bible says, Satan came also among them. Now, look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Now, notice this answer. This is our text first. And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from, from walking up and down in it. Now, yes or no, did God know what the devil was up to? Yes, he did. God asked the devil, so number one, the devil would tell us what he was up to because we didn't know, and now it's written down, so we do know. Notice in verse 8, we get into our text here and our point of the message. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Now, by the way, by the, after, the, uh, after the flood... The Bible says the population of the earth exploded. 
They were fruitful and they multiplied. They replenished the earth and people were being born left and right. And so it wasn't like there was a few people and just five or six people on the face of the earth or a few hundred. There were millions of people by this time covering the face of the earth. And then look, notice here, and the Bible says this in verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught or for nothing? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? And hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land? Now notice in verse 11. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Hmm, interesting observation from the devil. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Upon, oh, I'm sorry, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Let's pause. Father, we come before you tonight. We pray as we study this very intriguing text, this glimpse into eternity, into the throne room of God. Father, I pray that you'd help us as we understand, Lord, the, the workings of our adversary. Lord, we just thank you for tonight in Jesus' name, and amen. So tonight, as we look into our Bible, we're going to look at, from this passage here, uh, six things that the devil knows about you. Six things that the devil knows about you. Now, we might have considered, uh, as we think about God, how many of you know that God knows everything? Raise your hand. God knows everything. That's a wonder. Now, that's either a wonderful comfort or a terrifying thought, all right? All right? It's either a wonderful comfort that God has every hair numbered and God knows everything that's going on, or let me tell you something. That'll keep a backslider up at night with cold sweats in their bed, all right? And uh, my friend, the, 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 the answer to that is simply get right with God. And uh, there is nothing, there is no, it's been well said, there is no softer pillow than a clean conscience with God. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. Now, we know that God knows everything, but what we may not consider is how much the devil knows about us. Now, there are six things here that we're going to, uh, that we're going to look at briefly tonight in our time that we have here. And so I want to jump right into our text. Number one, you can write this down, the devil knows our name. The devil knows our name. As I mentioned, if you study out the Genesis account after the flood, the Bible says that the face of the earth was replenished again and people uh, exploded in population. And of all those millions of people and of all those many, many, many people, listen, God knew Job's name and we all say, sure, I understand that preacher, but listen, the devil knew Job's name as well. Look at that in verse 9. And then, answered, and then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth Job fear God for not without a hesitation, without saying, hey, let, let, me, let me pull up my contact list and, and let me see where he is, all right? Let me, let me look this guy up here, all right? Let me, all right let, for an old illustration, let's break out the phone book and, and go through the phone book and see if I can look up Job. No, the devil knew exactly who Job was. The, um, the devil, listen, he pays close attention to the children of faith. Now listen, the devil hates the Lord. He also hates those, number one, who love the Lord. The devil play, pays close attention to those who love the Lord and live for the Lord. Can I just say the devil doesn't get, those who are in his kingdom don't bother him. He already knows them. He already owns them. But the devil is particularly bothered by those who bother him. One preacher of the past said it this way, if the devil isn't picking on you, I would be concerned. How many of you would, by the signification of upraised hand, say, you know, every once in a while it feels like the devil's picking on me, all right? That's okay. It means it's one of the evident tokens of the fact that you're a child of God. Now, hold your place. Put something here in the book of Job, in Job chapter 1. Go over with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. I want to show you a New Testament corollary to this. In Acts chapter 19, there's an interesting uh, vignette that we're opened up to. Next chapter 19, uh, our verse particularly that we're looking at in verse, is verse 15, but I want you to look at verse 13 to get some context. And certain of the vagabond Jews, that means that there were groups of uh, Jews that were not particularly homeless, or, but they, they traveled, they were itinerant, uh, took upon themselves to call over, I'm sorry, uh, Jews, exorcists, 
all right, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, because they'd seen this uh, uh, happen and seen this work. He said, we adjure thee by the Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Now, there was no testimony of their salvation. There was no testimony in the Scripture of their indwelling uh, Spirit of God. There was no uh, uh, representation of their personal relationship with the Lord. They had just seen and heard the fact that through this name of Jesus, who we've heard this guy Paul preach, and we've seen demons cast out, that demons, unclean spirits, are cast out. Verse 14, and there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. This became a thing, this exorcism. Look at verse 15, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Now, that's, that's not a remarkable thing. Would you all agree with me? The fact that an unclean spirit who used to be an angel said, I, I, trust me, I know all about Jesus. But it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, and Paul, I know. Listen, my friend, not only did the devil know Job's name, but these unclean spirits knew exactly who the Apostle Paul was and what he was up to. Can I, get a, can I just ask you a question? Do you, do I, do we have a testimony that's known in hell? Do we have a testimony that's known in hell? Are we enough of a threat to the devil and to the demons and the kingdom of darkness that they say, hey, hey, I know about that. I know about that woman. That's a praying woman. That's a godly woman. That's a God-fearing woman. That's a God-fearing man. That's a man of God right there. And I'm not just talking about a preacher. I'm talking about a man who knows, who's saved and knows and walks with God. Do you and I, do we have a testimony known in hell? Notice it here. He says, but who are ye? These were lost, unsaved people. These, these were just uh, yahoos that were freelance exorcists. Listen, they had no relationship with the Lord, and they said, look, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, you people I don't, I don't know anything about. Now listen to me, the devil knows our name. Now, number two, go back to uh, Job chapter 1. Job in chapter 1. <clears throat> Job chapter 1. Second thing, not only does uh, the devil know our name, secondly, the devil knows our testimony. The devil knows our testimony. Notice he said, doth Job fear God for naught? The devil was in agreement with God on, uh, on the assessment of Job. The devil said, you know what? There's a man that fears God. Boy, there's a good testimony. You say, Pastor, could you help me? If you were just to reduce the Christian life to some of the most basic elements, can I say one of the most basic elements is, is there a marked testimony that you and I we reverently respect. The Bible calls that the fear of God. That means we order our thought life correct in, in accordance with what pleases God, that we order our lips and our life and our living in accordance to how God would have us to live. That's the fear of the Lord. It is to change our wicked ways. It's to, it's to pull against our law, our nature, the old nature, the fallen nature. And listen, to bring ourselves into agreement with how God would have us to live. The devil knows our testimony the thing you want to write there is that Job was real. Job was real. Job didn't go to synagogue or his gathering on Saturday or Sunday. Uh, but remember, this was pre-law. This was long before the law and the Sabbath and all that. Job didn't worship God out in public, listen, and then live for God, live for the devil in private. Job was the same in, in, in the public as he was in private. Job was the same God-fearing man at home as he was everywhere else. Job was real. The Lord and the devil were both very well, well aware of the genuine nature of Job's testimony. Now listen, you, you and I, we may be able to impress others. You and I may be able to even fool others. But there's three people you ain't fooling. You're not fooling God, you're not fooling the devil, and you're not fooling yourself most of the time. Some people are so deceived, they, do deceive, they, they are self-deceived. That's a sad situation. So if we want to reduce it to two people, you're not fooling, you're not fooling God, and you're not fooling the devil. Number two, the devil knows our testimony. Now, number three, we're hastening through this lesson tonight. Number three, the third thing that the devil knows about us 
is the devil knows the hedge, H-E-D-G-E, the hedge of God. Notice in verse 10. Notice in verse 10, I'm hastening not because I just want to hurry through the lesson, but we have had a tendency to bleed into 8 o'clock uh, and a little bit after, and I know it's a school night, and uh, I know we have, we have uh, people with children in the nursery and our toddlers and children's and teenagers, and, uh, and I know some of you got to be in your bunny slippers by 8.30 and having your bowl of cereal, and so I want to be mindful of all of that. Now, the devil knows the hedge of God. You say, what's a hedge? Look at verse 10, Job 1. The uh, devil says this, Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Question mark. Now, what is a hedge? A hedge is a protective wall, a protective wall that is planted or erected around a garden a field or a home, all right? Hold your Bible, hold your hand here, go back, go, go with me to Psalm 34 and verse 7. Psalm 34 is where we were for our memory verse. Look at Psalm 34 and verse 7. You say, well, what does that mean? What does that look like, pastor? Psalm 34 and verse 7, it says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. That's what a hedge is. A hedge is a protective wall. A hedge is a fence or a, a, a barrier. And see, on the outside is all of the wickedness and all of the, the, the forces of the devil. And on the inside is everything that God is protecting. Listen, my friend, the Christian life. Listen, the Christian life is not a prison that keeps us from enjoying the pleasures of sin on the outside. The Christian life is a fortified castle, listen, so that the devil can't spoil all the good stuff that God has given us. Amen? It's a fundamental shift in our Christian thinking. Uh, some people think that God has, has them fenced in, and oh, they look at all of the stuff that goes on out there and say, oh man, I don't get to enjoy all of that out there, not realizing it's not fun out there, it's terrible out. Sin is terrible, all right? When God hedges us in by giving us truth and principles and way to live and guidelines and, uh, and, and even doctrines to guide our thoughts in life and living, listen, that's not so that we don't get to enjoy what's on the outside. That gets, that's so that it protects what's on the inside. It's the reason why you have a door on your front door. It's the reason why that you have your valuables in a safe place. It keeps the hands off uh, the people who shouldn't have their hands on your valuable stuff, off your valuable stuff. Does that make sense? The devil knows the hedge of God. The believer enjoys both the protective presence of God. I want you to uh, uh, highlight that or underline that in your notes. The believer enjoys both the protective presence of God. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, it says, For he hath promised that he will never leave us, nor what? forsake us. Amen? We enjoy the protective presence of God as well as the ministry or ministering of the heavenly host. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, it says that God sends forth His angels to minister to the heirs of salvation. Now, my friend, one of the greatest things that I believe when we're going to get to heaven, we're going to get to see all the stuff that God did in protecting and preserving and guiding us all through our life that we never got to see. We get to see the, the back side of the story. So the devil, the devil knows the hedge or protection that God has placed around your life. The third thing that the devil knows is the devil knows, number three, the blessings of God. If you continue reading in verse 10, it, he says this, and, oh, I'm sorry, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. The third thing that the devil knows about us, seeing what we do not see, is the devil is fully aware of just how blessed and fortunate the child of God is. Hey, can I just ask, Christian, how good has God been to you? Has God been good to you? God has been so, so very good to us. Listen, we're rich with God's goodness and his mercies. You think about, listen, listen, God knows everything about you, and yet He still loves you. God knows everything you've ever thought, willed, or done, or thought about doing, and yet He still won't leave you or forsake you. 
that God knows the last gritty detail, and yet God still chooses to bless us over and over again. What a good God He is. God knows it. The devil knows it. We should understand it too. Listen, undeserved, yet God has blessed us, listen, with both presently and eternally. The devil knows the blessings of God. My friend, what's one of the reasons why in our adult Sunday school class, by the way, don't forget, uh, Sunday uh, we'll be meeting here, okay? We'll be meeting in the sanctuary because the fellowship hall will be set up. By the way, after the service, any, uh, that you, any of the able-bodied folks can help us set up the tables and chairs that will be a blessing for just a few minutes. Um, but my friend, listen, I want you and I, God knows His blessings on us. Listen, the devil is well, well aware of the blessings of God on our life. But listen, we have to pay attention. I won't take time in this, but those of you that have children and young children at home, how many of you would, take, would, would, would say yeah, that when kids are little, they just take for granted all that you do for them? They just take it for granted. They just do. They just assume that somebody magically stocks the refrigerator, all right? I never forget when I moved out, moved into my own home. I had to start buying groceries. I said, my lands, I go through a lot of groceries, all right? And, and, and then, then, they, then the, the, the utility bills came, and I went over and I turned the thermostat down in the summertime, or I turned the thermostat down in the wintertime, turned it up in the summertime. I said, my soul, I, we got to adjust this thing here. Oh, that's costing me a lot of money. You know, I had taken for granted all that had been done for me. Listen, my friend, I don't want to be someone that takes for granted God's blessings. How do you not take for granted God's blessings? You pay attention. The old song, count your many blessings, blessings, name them one by one. Listen, my friend, it will surprise you what God has done. Don't take God's blessings for granted. That's the third thing. Number four, number four, notice in verse 11. Uh, in verse 11, <clears throat> the devil makes an interesting statement here. He says, but, <clears throat> but, Put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. The fourth, fourth thing the devil knows about us, the devil knows our weaknesses. <clears throat> the devil knows our weaknesses. Now, the devil is an, a, a, an observer. The devil is one. You say, what does the devil spend his time doing? Well, number one, the Bible says that he's a deceiver. Number two, uh, that he is a liar. Uh, but the Bible says that he is a roaring lion that walketh about seeking. Listen, seeking, 1 Peter 5, 8, whom he may devour. The devil is an observer. The devil has spent time watching you and watched me long enough, listen, to know what our weaknesses are. In fact, if you'll turn over to Job chapter 3, Job chapter 3, notice the, 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 uh, the Lord, in, uh, first the Lord allows the devil to take away the de the Job's substance, his things, and then he comes back and take, uh, the, the devil asks to take away his health, and God allows him to do that. Now listen, why did the devil go after his wealth and his health? Because the devil knows how we react. He knows our weaknesses. Look at uh, verse, chapter 3 and verse 1. And after this, open Job his mouth and cursed his day. The devil had watched Job long enough to know where he was weak and vulnerable. Look at, in the same chapter, look at verse 25 and verse 26. Job says this, For the thing that I greatly feared is come upon me. And that which I was afraid of has come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, and yet trouble came. The devil knows our weaknesses. He knows where you're weak mentally, emotionally, physically, and personally. Why? Because the devil, go back, you say, well, why is that? Again, go back with me to Job chapter 1, our text verse, verse 7. Notice verse 7, with that in mind, I want you to pay closer attention to this interesting observation of what the devil reveals to us, what the Lord has the devil reveal to us. And the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, he said, from going to and fro in the earth and up and down in it. That's east and west, north and south. The devil is an observer. He's been observing you, and he's been observing me. Listen, he knows what you're tempted by. That's why the devil, and by the way, that's why Facebook and YouTube, you go on there. That's why the stuff on there is so very appealing, all right? Because they've been watching you. 
They've been watching what you've been searching for, look, watching what you've been interested in, what you've been Googling, what you've been binging, what you've been looking at. And so from one platform to the other platform, I don't know if the first time you noticed it, but you happen to be maybe on your computer and you're looking up vacuum sweepers, all right? Or for you, Tony, looking up new mattresses, all right? Ours is about 10, 15 years old, time to get another one. And, uh, and so you're looking up something, you're searching it, looking up prices and reviews and all that. And then I come over here on a completely different device and I pull up, and I pull up either an email account or a, a, a social media account, and then, hey, here's a brand new sweep. Are you interested in sweepers? I know, wait a minute. How in the world did you get from over here to over here? You know why? They're watching you. They know what I'm interested in, all right? By the way, that's why you better keep your searches clean, because uh, you, God, and Google know everything you've been looking at. So you ever ask yourself this question, why is it so, why do we fall into temptation so easily? Why is it that the little bait that the devil dangles in front, why is it that we fall to that? The answer is because the devil knows which temptation is just right for you and just right for me. He'll not waste his time pressing you in areas where he knows you have no weakness or inclination. He knows where you're weak, listen, and he will relentlessly attack you there. Now, the devil also knows uh, the, uh, let's see, I think that was number uh, that was number four. Number five. Number five, the devil knows his limits. The devil knows his limits. By the way, I think there's a verse in there uh, or a sentence, uh, but there's one final truth. Get rid of that, all right? That was, a, that was, a, uh, that was something from uh, another uh, lesson, and as I was putting things together and studying, that must have copied over accidentally. Now, the devil knows, yes, did I miss something? Oh, uh, yep, yep. Yep. He makes two Thank you. He makes two keen observations. First, on taking his wealth, his wealth, I apologize, in chapter 1 and verse 11, and then again about his health. I want you to notice this. So, in chapter 1 and verse 11, chapter 1 and verse 11, about his wealth, he says, put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. All right? You know when people get mad? When their bank account runs out. All right? Now, number two, look at chapter 2 and verse 5. This scenario is repeated again. And the Satan in verse 4, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, ye all that a man hath, he will give for his life or his health. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his crown. It means the top of his head. And he, that's Job, took him a pot sure to scrape himself for all, and he sat down among the ashes. Now listen, the devil had seen it enough times. When the finances collapse, people's trust and faith in God collapse. And some, he's not saying, people would hold out for that and say, you know what? As Job did, the Lord taketh, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, blessed be the name of the Lord. But the, the devil said, listen, yea, skin for skin, all the man hath, he'll give for his own life. He says, listen, you touch his health and he'll turn on you. You know why the devil could say that? He's seen it. He's seen it a lot. Now, uh, the fifth thing that the devil knows about us is the devil knows his limits. The devil knows his limits. Now, in both those times, in both of those cases, when the devil first went after his wealth, and then when the devil went after his health, the Lord says, listen, devil, you can go this far, and you stop. And listen, guess how far the devil went? He went right to the edge. But you know the truth is? The devil has no power, no authority, no ability to go beyond the limits of the Lord. My friend, that's a great comfort to the believer. Now, it's not a comfort to the believer that the Lord sometimes will allow His children to be tested, that the devil will allow His children to be tried, and sometimes to be taken to the very limit. The Apostle Paul, as he was relating the struggles he had in the area of Asia, he said, listen, we were pressed above measure. He said, we despaired even of life. He said, he said listen, we were right to the edge. He said, I couldn't take any more. You know why he couldn't take any more? Because the God had allowed the devil to take him to the very edge. But listen, guess what? The devil can never go beyond that edge. You know what the devil knows? The devil knows his 
limits. And by the way, one of the greatest benefits of being a child of God is being under the protection of the Lord. The devil knows that you belong to God. You don't belong to the devil. And the devil cannot go any farther than what the, uh, than what the Lord will allow. I think I missed one. You know what? Uh, is that all? Did I do all six? The devil knows his blessings, knows your weaknesses, three. I'm, I've, I've had to resort to paper here because I left my iPad someplace else. All right. All right. Did I get them all? I got them all. Okay. I got ahead of myself. Thank you very much. Amen. These, sorry about that. I knew this was going to be a problem because I'm trying to deal with paper. I haven't dealt with paper for years, all right? And then they get all uh, uh, cattywampus, and I'm cheap, so I double-sided them, but I did page number, all right? And uh, so listen, these six things the devil knows about you. Now, guess what? Now you know what the devil knows about you, and information is power. Now that you know what the devil knows about you, you guys are on the same page, now, you control what the devil knows about you. You know now what the devil knows about you. Now, the question is, what will you do about that? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. And Father, I apologize to you, Lord, for uh, not being more adequately prepared to teach the lesson or, Lord, to keep my thoughts and the, the, the lesson organized. And, uh, Lord, I don't, certainly don't want to distract from the truth. And so, Father, I, I ask you to forgive me for that. Lord, I pray and ask, dear Lord, that you would help us, uh, Lord, to understand, uh, Lord, that uh, while the devil is very powerful and very crafty, he's also very limited. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that you are our Heavenly Father and that you encamp around about us. And God, you watch over us. And Lord, while the devil has a great deal of influence in our life, Lord, you have control. And Lord, I pray that we would rest in that and we would, God, we glorify you in that. Lord, I pray and ask, dear Lord, that we would be a better Christian because of the truth that we've learned tonight. And God, we'd be more aware, not only what you know about us, but what the devil knows about us. Lord, I pray that we as God's people would stop giving the devil ammunition and opportunity to use our own sin and sinfulness against us. Lord, I pray that we would have a testimony like Job. And God, I pray, dear Lord, that you'd help us. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll stand to our feet tonight, a verse of invitation, a verse of invitation. If you have something that you need to pray about, something you need to seek the Lord about, something you've been struggling with, now's a, now's a good time.